copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Gloucester County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all cars to broadcast 260 regarding a fire. Assist the officers. That is all. Harmon. Grande unconditionally guarantees that Leo Lube, the 100% paraffin-based motor oil, will not break down under any engine heat or car speed, but will give your motor protective lubrication, add long years to its life, and lower cost of operation. In order to fulfill this guarantee, Rio Lube must be perfectly pure, hence the tamper-proof, refinery-sealed cans. And that's the only way real lube is sold. Bulk oil catches dust and grit, and dust and grit ruins any motor in time. At only a quarter a quart, you can protect your motor throughout its lifetime and feel secure in the knowledge that with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, you are giving your car and your pocketbook the best that money can buy. See your Rio Grande dealer at the red and white station tomorrow. to hear was taken from the confidential files of the Sheriff of Placer County. We have therefore asked Sheriff Elmer H. Gum of Auburn to open our program. The case we are to hear tonight was one of the most interesting in the history of California jurisprudence. This case is interesting in that it was the first trial in which the science of ballistics was employed to prove that a specific weapon was used to commit a murder. Another significant outgrowth of this case was the law which was enacted by the California legislature prohibiting the inheritance of money or property by a person who had committed a crime for that purpose. As a matter of record, this crime, as all others with which I have come into contact, was a most unprofitable affair. How the criminal was brought to justice, we shall learn as our program progresses. Our scene, the gallows room of Folsom Prison, the time 10.30 on the morning of September 6, 1905. Come on, Weber. Time to walk. No. No. I've been listening, I tell you. Now, that's all been decided. Come along. Cut out the dramatics. I didn't. Do it, Sheriff. You know. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Take it down. Yes, sir. Please do. Talk to him first, Father. I'll wait. Pull yourself together, son. What time is it? Almost 10.30. May I send one more wire? You can't hang an innocent man. If you want to, take the wire. Okay. What is it, Weber? Send it to my attorney. Send it to all of them. They've got to help me. What do you want to say? Uh, prevent execution. Insanity plea. Anything. Wire me answer at once. All right. Let's go. Send that as fast as you can or you'll be hanging an innocent man. Come on, Weber. You've stalled long enough. But I tell you I'm innocent. I didn't do it. <laughs> Up those steps, Weber. Do you want to go with him, Father? Yes. Let me help you, son. You believe I'm innocent, don't you, Father? You know I am, don't you? It isn't for me to say. I am not your judge. Come over here. No! No, I'm innocent! Could you help me fix this hood? <laughs> Is there anything you wish to say, my son? I didn't do it. Before God is my judge, I didn't do it. Kneel with me and pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, forgive this boy in his error. He knew not what he did. I didn't do it. 
We are all children and make many mistakes, some more serious than others. Mm -hmm. And so as this mm -hmm. boy, Adolf Welbert, stands on the threshold of the great adventure, <coughs> help him in the life hereafter to atone for his wrongdoing. <coughs> Amen. Even you believe I'm guilty. Put this over your head. Telegram! The telegram! You've got to wait for the telegram! What time is it, please? Fifteen <laughs> seconds to ten thirty. Fifteen seconds. A lifetime. <laughs> You'd better leave the platform, Father. <laughs> Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds more. You've got to answer my telegram. <laughs> You've got to save me. The whole trial was a fake. They're all trumped up charges. They all lied. I'm innocent. I didn't do it. The trial was broken. They're murdering an innocent man. <laughs> Attorney George Hamilton for the state of California and the people will give his closing argument. <coughs> Your Honor, <coughs> gentlemen of the jury, we have before us a question to answer. A question that can have but one answer. Is that man sitting over there, Adolph Weber, Guilty or not guilty? He is charged with murder. Think that over, gentlemen. That man sitting slumped over in his chair with a smirking grin spread across his face is charged with the willful and wanton killing of his own mother. He is suspected of murdering his father and his sister and his brother and will be tried for those crimes later. But at present, we are concerned only with the shooting of Mary Weber. Let's go back and review the case from the start to the present. On the evening of November 4th, 1904, a fire broke out in the Weber home on the hill overlooking Auburn. The fire department rushed to the scene and fought desperately. A few minutes later, it was discovered that there were four people trapped in the raging inferno. Julius Weber, his wife, Mary Weber, their daughter, Bertha Weber, and their youngest son, Earl Weber. The work of rescuing these four people was started immediately. Clarence Gere and George Ruth carried the bodies oh, out. Take way. Give me room. I've got Miss Weber. Stand back, everybody. Give her air. Lay her out here, Clarence. Here comes George, Ruth, and Bertha. Keep back, everybody. Somebody help me. Get a doctor. Get Dr. Rooney. Do what you can. I'm going back after Earl. He's still in there. You can't go back in there. You'll be killed. I'll be back in a minute. Where's Adolph? Is he in there, too? No, he's sitting over there under the magnolia tree. I guess he must be stunned by all this. Hey, Adolph, are you all right? Now where's he going? What's he going to do with that bundle? Here comes Dr. Rooney. Get back, folks. All right. Let him through. All right. I got here just as soon as I could. Uh, somebody bring me some water. Are they still alive, Doctor? Look, Adolf just threw that bundle through the dining room window. He's going to try and reach his little brother. I can't oh, find any little... signs of life in either body. They're both pretty badly burned, too. Let him through. Here's Earl. I couldn't find Mr. Weber. Now, let me see him. Oh, the poor boy. Just has fallen. He did too, Doc. I can't tell you. Hello, Dr. Rooney. Are they all dead? Hello, Adolf. Are they dead? Yes, my boy, I'm afraid they are. They're all pretty badly burned. They hadn't been rescued just when they were. You're sure they're dead? Yes, positive. You were very brave to try and help rescue the major. Huh? What do you mean? We saw you throw that bundle through the window and break it. If the fire hadn't suddenly flared up, I, I'm sure you would have saved your little brother. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I was trying to rescue him. I was going to climb in the window and drag him out. <laughs> but the fire was too hot.
And so these three bodies were taken from the blazing house. The body of Julius Weber was not found until the next day. Now, there are two points of importance in what I have just told you. One is that Adolf Weber didn't attempt to help in the rescue work. Edna Fulton has testified that he sat under the magnolia tree and viewed the scene as a spectator. The other point is the throwing of the bundle through the window of the living room, or the dining room, rather. That bundle on Adolf Weber's own statement was a pair of trousers. Why did the defendant throw them through the window? Edna Fulton testified that she thought he intended climbing into the room and saving his brother Earl's life. Clarence Gear testified that he found the body of Earl in the dining room, as were the bodies of Mary and Bertha Weber. How did the defendant know Earl was there? The dining room was shut up and did not start to blaze until Weber broke the window and created a draft. Remember that, gentlemen. Adolf Weber knew the bodies were in the dining room. The following day, a discovery was made in the coroner's office. Sheriff Keener was called in and acquainted with... Get this straight. You say, Dr. Rooney, that they were all dead before the fire started? Yes. Mary Weber was shot through the heart. Bertha Weber was shot in the chest, and so were Julius Weber and Earl. I'll be... Have you got the bullet? Yes. Uh-huh. Here they are. Hmm. Four slugs from a forty-five. Uh-huh. I found one in Mrs. Weber's body and one in Bertha's body. And Mr. Weber was killed by one, Earl by the other. Who do you think did it? Don't ask me. It's your job, sir, Sheriff Keener. Well, your guess is as good as mine, Doctor. It might have been murder and suicide. Old Julius could have done it. Yeah, it's possible. But then again, what would be his motive? There was never any trouble in that family that I ever heard about. Did you? No. And say I ever did. Might have been a robber. Well, I've thought of that, too. But on the other hand, now, don't forget, they were all shot from in front. Now, it seems reasonable to suppose one of them might have tried to run away. Certainly a stranger couldn't have gone from room to room and one after the other shot the whole family without so much as causing a stir. That's sound reasoning, Sheriff Connor. Mighty sound. But there's still this question to answer. Who did it? Uh, let's see. Adolph wasn't there. He was downtown, so he couldn't have done it. Julius, the father, could have, though. Doesn't make sense. There's no motive. Now, if there'd been some money involved, there might be a... Hey, what's happened to you? That might be the motive. Money. I don't get you. Who'd receive the bulk of the estate in the event that Mr. Weber died and there was no remaining heirs? My golly, Sheriff, I believe you're right. I know I am. And then again, Adolf has an alibi and can prove it. Maybe. Edna Fulton was at the Weber house and left about 5.30 that evening. The fire was discovered about 6.30, one hour later. Now, Adolf said he took his usual evening walk around back of town and then down into town. Suppose he was lying and had hightailed it straight down Brewery Lane. But can you prove it? Well, if that's what he did, I'll prove it. In the course of his investigations, Sheriff Keener questioned Joe Powell, clerk at the American Hotel. Now think hard, Joseph. Real hard. Well, you see, Adolph, he'd come in here one night this week, but so much has happened in such a short time. I can't just remember what night it was. Adolph uh, came in here to the American Hotel often, didn't he? Oh, sure. That's why I can't remember that November 4th. But he was in here this week. Now, you're sure about that? Oh, I'm dead sure on that, because I was back in the washroom doing some cleaning up in there, and he comes in, and... See, he didn't see me, and he starts to wash his hands. Well, I spoke to him, and it scared him so bad he ran out the door. He didn't even dry his hands or turn. He didn't even turn off the tap. He just... Well, didn't that strike you as odd? Uh, well, it, you know, looked kind of crazy at the time, but I didn't think no more about it. I just... Uh, what did you do after he left? And I, oh, let's say I finished cleaning up in there and went out to the front of the desk. Yeah. Well, then what happened? 
I don't just remember. Seems to me something happened, but I could just... Uh, wait a minute. Say, that was the night of the fire. Sure, I remember now, because I got hail Columbia for not staying at the desk out there. That's all I wanted to know. Clark, May Clark, had additional information on the case. Well, you see, Sheriff, I was coming up Brewery Lane from the American when Adolph passed going down. He seemed in kind of a hurry, and he didn't even hardly speak to me. Did you notice anything strange? No, except he seemed in a hurry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had a bundle under his arm. Must have been that pair of pants he throwed through the dining room window. Uh, what time was that? Why, it was just before the fire. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. I was expecting a, a friend of mine at 6.30, so I, I know it was just before the fire. That's why I was going back to my room. Well, thanks, May. You've given me a lot of help. Well, if I can be of any more help to you again, why, just let me know, Sheriff. With this information, Keena sent for Weber. I left the house soon after Edna Fulton did. I walked across the hills, back of town, then turned back and walked down the hill into town. You didn't walk down Brewery Lane to the American? I told you how I walked. Were you in the American Hotel just before the fire alarm was sounded? I might have been. I drop in there frequently. Did you see anyone on your walk? No. Did you see anyone at the American? I didn't say I was there. That's right, you didn't. Uh, what were you carrying a pair of pants under your arm for? Well, I'd torn a hole in them. I was taking them down to the tailor's to see if he had another pair to match them. He was closed. Why did you throw that same pair of pants through the dining room window at the fire? That should be obvious to a man of your intelligence, Sheriff. Hmm. Perhaps more obvious than you think. How interesting. You don't by any chance suspect me of killing my entire family, do you? Uh, one other thing. Who receives the Weber fortune? Why, I do, of course. I'm the sole surviving heir. How much was it? Well, I can't say that it's any of your business, but it's around $70,000. $70,000? Tidy little fortune. Adolph Weber, I arrest you for the murder of your mother, your father, your sister, and your brother. All right, boys, take him out and lock him up. And so, with the information he had gained, Sheriff Keener arrested Adolph Weber on suspicion of murder. Inasmuch as it is not possible to try a man for more than one crime at a time in the state of California, we are therefore trying the defendant first for the murder of his mother... Mary Weber, and gentlemen of the jury, I thank God that Julius Weber is dead. I thank God that Bertha Weber and this defendant's little brother are dead. I thank God that we do not have to see them come into this courtroom and from that witness stand with tears running down their cheeks describe Adolph Weber's crime. I give thanks to a beneficent providence that these persons are dead, that they do not have to come here to swear away the life of this man. <laughs> but to resume our review of the facts, a few days later, one of Sheriff Keener's men found the gun that was used to commit these murders, a gun from which four bullets had been fired. The defense asked to see proof that this was the weapon Adolph Weber used. We proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. As you recall, we summoned Howard Carr from San Francisco. He is a recognized expert on firearms. The defense has asked us to prove that this was the gun used to murder Mary Weber. Very well. Boys, will you stand that bale of cotton over by the wall? Now, Mr. Carr, if you'll explain to the court just what you intend doing, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hamilton. I have here in my hand the four slugs taken from the dead bodies of Julius Weber, his wife, his daughter, and his younger son. After placing these under a microscope, I observed that there were certain markings, certain identical markings on each bullet. Then I examined the barrel of the revolver and discovered the cause of these markings. There was a slight obstruction on one side that left a groove on each slug as it passed through the barrel. 
These markings were so small <clears throat> that they could only be seen with the aid of a powerful microscope. I was convinced that these four slugs were fired from this pistol, but to further prove the fact, I fired several more bullets from this same gun, and after examining them closely, I found them to be grooved identically like the fatal bullets marked as Exhibit D. And now, Mr. Carr, are you ready to demonstrate to the court what you've just said? Yes, sir. Very well, proceed. As you can observe, gentlemen, we've placed a thick bale of cotton against the opposite wall into which Mr. Howard Carr will fire four bullets. Proceed. Now, gentlemen of the jury, it is your privilege to examine for yourselves the four bullets taken from the bodies and then the four that have just been fired and are being removed from the bale of cotton. Look closely and you will see that they all look alike. Definite proof, gentlemen, that all eight bullets were fired from the same gun. And let me remind you that this gun was found in the Weber barn among Adolph Weber's personal effects. And one other point. The empty cartridges were found nearby where this fiend threw them. Now, if you'll step down one at a time, you may all look through this microscope to see for yourself. So you've all looked through the microscope and have seen for yourselves that this undoubtedly was the gun from which the fatal bullets were fired. Hard it is to believe that a man can kill his mother. All that he has, he owes to her. It was she who bore him, reared him, taught him, and promised herself that in her old age he'd be a comfort and joy to her. I say it is hard to believe that a man can kill his mother. But I say to you also that if there is such a man upon the face of this earth, that man sits here. <laughs> Let me once more reconstruct the crime for you. The father, Julius Weber, was in the kitchen closet. And his sister, Bertha Weber, was playing the piano and singing. The mother, Mary Weber, was putting the younger brother, Earl, to bed. It was then that this fiend, with gun in hand, deliberately and calmly walked up to his father, and without the slightest hesitation... Looking for something? Huh? Oh, hello, son. Well, yes, I used to have some... Adolf, <laughs> what are you doing with that gun? <laughs> Put it down. Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> now, little sister, I shall do the jewel next. <laughs> Bertha? Bertha, turn around a minute. Oh, hello, Adolf. I was just... <laughs> now, my dear... Brother. What happened, Adolf? <laughs> Didn't I hear shots? Adolf. Adolf, what happened? What's the matter with Bertha? Nothing, Mother. I just shot her. Dolphy. Dolphy, put that gun down. Don't point it at me. <laughs> oh. Mother. Mother. It's all right, Earl. Be quiet. I'll be right up. Just a minute. I'll send to you, all right. Mama. Now, what's all the racket about, Earl? Where's Mother? Never mind me, Mother. What you got in your hand? A gun. What you gonna shoot? <laughs> <laughs> and so he carried his brother, his sister, and his mother down to the dining room. His father he left in the kitchen closet. Then after carefully setting fire to the house, he started across the hills and then doubled back into town. 
And there he had the nerve to calmly eat an ice cream soda. But he made one mistake. He left the dining room shut up. And since a fire needs a draft, that room failed to burn. When Adolph Weber returned to his burning home, he made this discovery and quickly made his way to the dining room window and threw his trousers at the window and broke it, thereby causing a draft, and the room burst into flames. He served a double purpose by this act as he wished to rid himself of telltale evidence. Although he denied it, it seems reasonable to assume he wished to rid himself of these trousers because they were splashed with blood! In conclusion, gentlemen of the jury, there is one more vital fact that you must not overlook. And that is that Adolph Weber is the sole heir to a $70,000 estate. That supplies his motive. Now you have all the facts before you. Why he killed, how he killed, and the gun he killed with. Every point, every step dovetails perfectly. As citizens of this state, I implore you to do your duty. Give this man who sits even now sneering and smirking while I talk, give this man the justice he deserves. Give him the same quality of mercy that he gave his mother as she knelt before him begging for her life. The gut says to my telegram. The gut to save me. The whole trial was a fake. It was all trumped up charges. They're all lying. I read his intention to do it. The trial was crooked. They're murdering it. It was the man you can't hang me. Quiet, Weber. Step over I here. I don't want to. I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. Step over here. <laughs> I don't want to die. Put your hands behind you. No. Don't tie my hands. I don't want to hang. There. That'll hold you. <laughs> Whimpering coward. <laughs> hold still while I put this rope around your neck. My lawyers have got to save me. Don't hang me yet. <laughs> that rope's too tight. You're hurting me. Shut up. <laughs> All set, Sheriff Keenum. <laughs> moment, we shall hear the concluding facts on our program. Incidentally, just a reminder, on your way to work in the morning, drop around for that tank full of Rio Grande cracked, the gasoline of real police car performance. And if you're in need of an oil change, ask for Real Lube, the motor oil that engine heat and speed can't break down. Real Lube can't get gritty, can't be diluted, can't be substituted, because it is sold only in refinery sealed cans, never in bulk. Adolph Weber was convicted after one of the most sensational cases in the history of California. He was sentenced to die, and on the morning of September 6th, he was hanged in Folsom Prison. His was another crime that failed to pay. Calling all cars, attention all cars to cancellation on broadcast 260 regarding a murder and a fire. Suspect in this case was hanged. That is all, Harmon. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present The Case of the Rasping Voice. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.